Hello, my gorgeous little chickens. So in this video, we're going to be talking about whether Thomas Paine is easier to read than Edmund Burke. And we will also discuss what makes some of the history passages a lot harder for you to comprehend. And as always, I have my little outline of today's video. So let me just show it to you real fast. It will consist of four parts. First, we're going to talk about something super important. It's called readability formula. Then we're going to be talking about unusual subjects because some passages use subjects that are unusual. Then we're going to talk about, this is super important, three big ways to prepare your comprehension. You see, so many of you have this um, flawed idea that expert readers understand and comprehend everything they read all of the time. Let me tell you, as an expert reader myself, nothing could be further from the truth. Every time I read a history passage, my comprehension breaks down anywhere from two to three times. My comprehension breaks down all of the time. But the difference between some of you who are struggling with comprehension and myself is that I have the tools to repair my comprehension when it breaks down. I just I don't necessarily continue blastering through the words hoping that it will make sense. Mm -mm. I like to think of reading as kind of like driving the car and whenever my comprehension breaks down, it's almost like I get a flat tire. I'm not going to continue driving when I have a flat tire. I'm not going to continue reading when I have a comprehension breakage. So I'm going to go ahead and repair it, but we're gonna talk about this later. Remember when I was showing you my outline, there were four items on the outline completely got sidetracked. Number four on the outline, we're going to be talking about how sentence length affects your reading comprehension. Um, my name is Katya Severson. I'm the inventor of the Severson Method, scientifically proven way to learn anything fast. I also run a, a membership website, it's called SAT Verbal, where you can get a lot more help from me to help you improve your reading comprehension your grammar skills, and raise your overall score on the SAT. Let's start the video. So this video was actually inspired by one of you chickens. And uh, my new friend, his name is Guru Ram. He says this, Super Samantha, please more, make more videos on breaking Edmund Burke's prose, colon. So he's like, let me tell you more what I mean by that. It's harder to understand his arguments than Thomas Paine's. That got me thinking, really? Is it really harder? Because with reading, it's very subjective. Perhaps he's more familiar with the liberal agenda than the conservative. Therefore, Thomas Paine is easier for him to read and vice versa. So um, to step away from subjectivity and become a little bit more objective, I had to remember some of my schooling. <laughs> so when you go to grad school to teach people how to read, you have to go through this um, process of learning how to use readability formula, formulae, formulas, and identify the level of reading when you're looking at a passage. And there is a ton of these readability formulas. There's a ton of literature on it. But now there is a website. Then now you could use a uh, website, and of course I did, where I plugged in one passage by Thomas Paine and one by Edmund Burke. Guess what? So this one, I hope you're seeing my screen. So this one was actually for um, Edmund Burke. And I know this website looks very sketchy, but it's very accurate. They tell you exactly what goes into the formula. So you could read um what is it that they're paying attention to what does the rating mean um you know for example this first one this one is a flesh reading ease score um if this is an elementary school passage let's say this is dr seuss type of level the score is going to be a hundred and with the lowering of the score um the difficulty increases so this is kind of like an inverse trend the lower the score, the higher the difficulty. So the lower the readability score on this um, particular, in this particular uh, formula. But then they actually do tell you, fairly difficult to read, hard to read, 11th grade. And then they sort of like average them out and they give you a readability consensus. So the readability consensus 
for Edmund Burke is that it is 11th grade. Let's take a look. What is the readability consensus for Thomas Paine? Thomas Paine, the readability consensus, is a little bit higher. Consistently, all of, well, it's interesting because this Coleman guy, <laughs> um, and many of you know that the CEO of the College Board, his name is David Coleman. I'm not sure if the spelling is the same, but maybe that's why he's throwing all of these passages at us because he's using this specific formula. This, according to other um, formulas, this is college graduate and above. So these formulas are not very reliable. But what we can do is because we're using the same formulas, at the very least, we can compare two types of reading. And I took um, The Rights of Men uh, by um, Thomas Paine and um, Reflections on the Revolution in France by Edmund Burke. And it actually, according to this website, that is a lot more objective than my opinion and Guru Ram's opinion. Thomas Paine is actually more difficult. Here's what they're paying attention to. They're paying attention to the number of words in the sentence. So the longer the sentence, the harder it is to read. Why is it though? How do you, why do you guys think that these things are connected? We're gonna talk about it later, but why do you think longer sentences are harder to read? Because it's harder for you to identify your basic sentence structure. If we have a basic sentence like Nina runs early in the morning, all of the sentences represent essential information. All of the words in the sentence represent essential information. But whenever we start adding um, information like Nina, smiling from ear to ear, runs, vigorously early in the morning after she's done with her errands. Now the sentence becomes blown up. The core of the sentence is still Nina runs early in the morning, but now it becomes so much more difficult for you to locate your basic sentence structure. So therefore more words, more difficult to read, but they're also paying attention to the nature of your words, whether your words are multisyllabic or singular syllabic, which means how many syllables are in your, um, in your words and more syllables means more complexity. Um, so if we're listening to this objective thing, um, Mr. Ram, <laughs> they disagree with you, but I do find something. There's a bit of a glitch in um, Edmund Burke's writing, and I want to show it to you. So for those of you who have seen my video about what's a subject, you know that a subject could be one of the four things. It could be a noun, it could be a pronoun, it could be a proper noun, or it could be a gerund. So we're not expecting an infinitive phrase to be a subject. So I'm going to the next thing. The readability formula talked about it. Unusual subjects. So there is something that um, uh, our fabulous Edmund Burke does. He uses unusual subjects. His subjects are not nouns. He doesn't say the table. <laughs> His subjects are sometimes pronouns, but here, take a look. To make a government, that is a subject, requires. So when I underline so that um, if you, for those of you who are not in SAT verbal, just so you can follow, subject is underlined with one line, verb is underlined with two, object is circled. To make a government, that's my subject, requires. That's my verb, no great prudence. That's my object. Prudence is thoughtfulness. Please, all of you, write this down if you didn't know that. Next sentence, right after it. To give freedom, that's again my subject. Is my verb still more easy? So if you read through his uh, manifesto, which is written in a form of a letter, which is quite interesting, you're going to notice that he uses a lot of this. Like, to give them credit for what they have done in virtue, in, in virtue for the authority they have usurped or which can excuse in their crimes by which that authority has been 
acquired. It must appear, that is your main subject actually, it must appear that the same things could not have been accomplished without producing such a revolution. By giving them an excuse for what they've done, it must appear that these things couldn't have been done without, um, without producing such a revolution. So that is something that makes um, his writing a little bit more difficult to decipher. So maybe kind of like with an asterisk, add for yourself that sometimes, very infrequently, but sometimes, an infinitive phrase like to make a government or to give freedom or to excuse them for what they've done can be a subject. To excuse them for what they've done may be appropriate if. To give freedom appears to be. So unusual subjects is something that is, um, I find um, especially interesting for him. Now, let's talk about the three big ways to repair my comprehension. Before we can talk about trucks backing up, boats that are parking, <laughs> this is a boat. Um, before we can talk about um, the three big ways to repair your comprehension, you must also be aware that your comprehension has broken down. In the SAT verbal, we talk a lot about monitoring your comprehension. We talk a lot about taking responsibility for your own awareness, because I cannot do this for you as your trainer. Um, as your math tutor, I can look at your solution and I could see, oh, right here, calculation error, or right here, your logic breaks down. When we read, it is 100% your responsibility. I could have guesses, I could have suggestions. I think you may find this sentence complicated, but you must, must track your own comprehension. And when you spot a sentence where your comprehension breaks down, you could use those three big tools. Big B-I-G. This is what they stand for. This is an acronym, so it's easy to memorize. B stands for blurb. It is so important when reading Edmund Burke to know that he's talking about French and he himself is a Brit. He uses a ton of references, which if you forget that he's talking about the French Revolution and National Assembly actually happens to be a governmental institution of France that has been freshly built. So if my comprehension breaks down, the first thing I do on the SAT is I go back to the blurb. Think about all of those relationships that are often announced in the beginning of the prose fiction passage. If you go back and revisit them, like, oh, Ida is this guy's girlfriend, and they're watching the performance. Oh, I see now. So blurb has to be the number one repair tool for you when your comprehension breaks down. Number two, I. I is an example of a personal pronoun. So when you're thinking about your big tools to repair your comprehension, your second tool is pronouns. Am I... Am I tracing through my pronouns right here? Um, let's see, let's see. Right here. This, I do not find in those, another pronoun, who take the lead in the National Assembly. So this is my, this is the word that is a directional pronoun. Guess what? When he starts this sentence in line nine, he is referencing to something that he has previously said. Your brain is not going to pause you and say, uh, hey, uh, Guru Ram, or whatever, whatever your name is like, hey, Katya, I think we are losing comprehension here. Unless you're consciously tracking it, you're not going to notice, oh, there's a pronoun and I must ensure that I'm tracing the information through. So this is your pronoun work. Or sometimes he says, we need to look up to them. Who are them? Are those English people? Are those British people? Are those American people? Or uh, American people again, like French? Who needs to look up to who? So I stands for pronouns. G is grammar, my friends. This is your last, um, 
tool, like one of the big um, tools for repairing your comprehension. Can I take a sentence, a long sentence, just grab any, and then figure out its main subject, its main verb, its main, what I like to call them is, what are my main $100 ideas? So let's grab this long sentence. What do I see? There is a comma and, which I am anticipating to mean that this is going to be a comma fanboy, which is another clause, and it's going to be a long sentence. So I need to be very careful. And my readability, the way I like to um, define it is how easy it is for me to get to this. How easy it is for me to get to subject, verb, complement, or object, or additional phrases. Um, remember how we talked about what could be a subject? This is just something I kept from a session with a client. But my readability goes down when it becomes more difficult, more crowded for me to narrow it down to my subjects, my verbs, my complement or objects or additional phrases. Okay, so let's, let's do this just for fun. Moderation, that is a noun, so that would be my subject. Moderation will be stigmatized. If you don't know what stigmatized is, please look it up. Um, moderation will be stigmatized as the virtue of cowards, comma, and that's my another $100 idea, compromise, and then it's kind of like implied here, will be stigmatized as prudence of traitors, as prudence of traitors, until in the hopes of preserving the credit, which may enable him, again, who is him? him to temper and moderate on some occasions. The popular leader, by the way, him is the popular leader. The popular leader is obliged, and what is he obliged? To become active in propagating doctrines and establishing powers. What kind of doctrines and what kind of powers? This is my relative clause. That will afterwards defeat any sober purpose at which he ultimately might have aimed. This is my this is my sentence. It has three main ideas. Moderation will be stigmatized as um, as a value of those who are uh, afraid. Compromise and um, will be um, will be stigmatized will be thought of as um, carefulness of traitors until the popular leader is obligated is um, going to become, is going to have to, is obliged to become, right? Is going to have to uh, promote doctrines, values, and establish powers that defeat the purpose at, what, at which he aimed. So right here, uh, our fabulous Edmund Burke is talking about the consequence of the French Revolution, the way he sees it, from establishing National Assembly, from not being too thoughtful. Um, this is a fabulous, fabulous, um, fabulous read. Um, if you watch this video until the end, I'm gonna let you know how you can get your own reading walkthrough from me that is not available anywhere else. Okay, uh, so we just talked about the three big ways to repair your comprehension crossing this out. And lastly, how does sentence length affect your comprehension? It affects your comprehension in a huge way. It affects your comprehension greatly. And if you're not gentle with your mind, you are throwing your mind into a sea of words, not really considering how hard it is for your brain to process all of this information. Um, in the SAT Verbal, I have a class uh, called how reading is unnatural and not innate. Reading is indeed a very difficult process for the brain to accommodate. And if you've heard this phrase before, human beings only use 4% or 10% of their brains. This is nonsense, and here's why. They should look at the brain scan of a person who is reading. Your occipital lobes that are right here, they are responsible for um, vision because you need to take in information 
from both of your eyes, from left hemisphere and, and right hemisphere. So your vision is involved right here. Then you need to be thinking as you're reading. Just FYI, all of you, you need to be thinking when you're reading. Your cognition is involved. That's in the prefrontal cortex, right? Then you need to be moving either your pen or you need to be moving your eyes. So your motor is uh, now also involved. Now, you also need to be accessing three layers of your cortex because you need to connect audio files of the sounds that you're making with the from the words with the definitions and your are um short for time <laughs> you need to be doing it very quickly and accurately and it's a this exam is a big deal there's a ton of work that goes on in your brain and if you are throwing your brain at sentences Without doing this thing that I kind of, you know, try to um, teach you so that it becomes um, almost like a reflex for you. As soon as I start reading my sentence, I always notice where the sentence ends. Because I want to know how many words are we working with. Because I would never approach the sentence of this length and the sentence of this length in a similar way. Not at all. I would not be previewing my sentence that's that's two lines long, but I would be previewing the sentence that is uh, one, two, three, four, five. You know, anything that's greater than four lines, I need to step back. I need to see whether there's a noun phrase. I'm kind of unpacking the meaning slowly. I hope this video really helped you chickens. In terms of Thomas Paine, he is just as complicated as um, Edmund Burke. Take a look. His sentences are actually even longer. There's a ton of ellipses. He is, the only thing that he doesn't do is he doesn't use infinitive phrases as his nouns. I'm open to a discussion. If you can prove to me that Thomas Paine is in fact easier for you to read, or maybe you're just more familiar with the leftist ideas and therefore you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Your brain doesn't resist those ideals because um, he's very welcoming of the French Revolution. He says this is uh, a pivotal point in our civilization. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. You rock. And since you are so dedicated and you're watching the video all the way to the end, I have a gift for you. I will record a special reading walkthrough of this Edmund Burke Reflections on the Revolution in France. And I will make it available only for you when you email me and you ask for it. So email me at katia at executivemind.net and the subject line should be Edmund Burke walkthrough. I'll email you the link and hope you enjoy. And as always, whenever you leave comments below this video, you get some awesome perks. You get entered into the draw, into the pool of people that we choose from every month to enter a CT verbal for free, we choose two people. So your chances have doubled from last month. Now, what you wanna do is you wanna leave a comment, this video, other video, please be subscribed and uh, likes obviously um, encourage me. The more encouraged I am, the more videos I make for you. And also don't wait to win the free membership. You can join SAT Verbal, it's a wonderful place and a ton of benefit from it. I'll see you there, bye.